please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. We have Mr. Stephen Harper, the former Prime Minister of Canada. Thank you for being here. We have Miss, you can clap in between. We have Erin Saltman, Director of Programming at the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. Hello, Erin. James Carafano, the Vice President of the Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation in the US. Marcin Busanski, Senior Advisor at the Warsaw Security Forum from Poland. Hello. And last but not least, Shlomit Wagman from Harvard University and former chair of the Money Laundering and Terror Financing Prohibition Authority from Israel. Hello, Shlomit. So before we dive into the current dynamics, I don't know what kind of crowd we have in here exactly. So James, could you please bring us all up to speed very quickly? What's the state and the non-state and the quasi-state and what are the, like, the main differences that we have to keep in mind for counter-terrorism responses going forward into the discussion? Very briefly. Oh yeah, I, it's, I, it's so retro, right? This is so 2001. <laughs> I feel like we should be playing um, disco music. Um, so, uh, so the, 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 I mean, it is worth starting with just kind of a, a, the definitions as, as they're commonly accepted. So state actors are relatively obvious. It means if you, a, a sovereign state is a recognized authority, so any, any entity working under the direction or under the legal authority or, or, or responsibility of the state is considered a, a state actor. So that's pretty easy. Um, Non-state actors are also pretty easy as they're not affiliated with a um, a sovereign authority, and where it gets uh, you know complicated in the complicated world, we you know, this is what do you mean by a quasi non-state actor? And that could be a range of things. It could be a um, what, what's often called a, a state sponsor, so a group that is working directly for a sovereign state, but there's a denial of of um, of falling under the 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 authority and obligation and direction of that state, um, or or you could have um, you know, uh, a group that affiliates. With a, with a state for some activities, but not others. Um, and that could be either be you know, hidden or, or, um, or, or advertised. So, so for example, you know, a group like Wagner, which uh, is a question of how much direction this takes if it's state or a Russian hacking group, or um, a, a non-state group, which, which may take money and affiliation and direction to state, but how closely is the lead of that? So what's, I think to me, the most interesting question to really address tonight because the reason why this is resurgence is not because we're all nostalgic for 9-11, um, but because we live in a world where um, almost every state sees some compilation of a variation of these, of these threats. Uh, and, and I actually think that one of the questions we, get, we should address and be asking ourselves is, is it really worth it breaking them into these silos? Because the reason why we did that is we, there was this expectation that the, the threat and response were different for all three. And therefore, you had to quantify something into a basket so you knew how to address it. And, and I just wonder if the world has gotten to the point where that's really, not, that's really not worth doing anymore. And it actually complicates your response to do that. Um, you know, part of this is, is we push against the history of our own traditions. And one of the reasons why this conversation is difficult, and I'll just end on this note, and, and, and why it's so complicated is we, we universally can't perceive these problems the same way. And that history and, and that the legal and historical framework very much changes that. So the, having a universality of discussion on this is virtually impossible. And the, and, the, and the different situations also make it very difficult to have a universal thing. In the US, for example, the American tradition, we had two very firmly different security systems. We had an external security system, which was designed to look at problems beyond the border, and actually dealing with state, non-state, and quasi-state threats wasn't as, as difficult to manage because you know, some people had, it didn't really matter. So when the CIA operates overseas, it doesn't really, in terms of US law, have this enormous distinction between whether it's dealing with a state actor or a non-state actor or a quasi-state actor. But what we had internally in the United States in our great tradition was in order to ensure uh, the protecting the individual liberties and freedoms of Americans, 
we, ref we tried as hard as possible to refrain from having a centralized internal security apparatus because most of our internal threats were, were, non, were, were you know, criminal and, or you know, other non-state threats. And the, and, and the notion was is protecting the civil liberties and freedoms of individuals and citizens was, was more important um, and then quashing these threats. And to use the instruments we use externally, internally, could actually you know, create civil society problems. So for example, in the US by law, the CIA can't operate domestically in the United States. And that, that system really began to break down on 9-11, um, where we started to create um, much more internal, synchronized and integrated infrastructure. But the notion is, is don't worry, we'll, we'll still respect all the equities. And today, we're actually reaping the challenge of that which is, the, this is the, the, the one great challenge in, in all security situations, which is if, if you want your state to be free and you want your state to be prosperous and you want your state to be secure and you want all three and all three objectives, how do you, how do you manage that? So when you add internal security to deal with a security threat, how do you impact that? And we see all, we, we, because forever mm -hmm. the problems we're having in the United States and others, mm -hmm. but other people have that as well. But, and that's the American tradition. The Indian tradition is different. Um, people that lived under regimes in, um, in, in Central Europe during um, the communist era have a different tradition. And so I think that's why, you know, if we're looking for an answer, there is no answer. And w when we kind of get into the tactics and uh, that, I think it's much yeah. more fruitful. And we go to this real challenge is what do we really James, gain from doing different <laughs> may I interrupt you? Thank you for establishing the concepts and questioning them right away. I hope we can answer all those big challenges. Let's switch to something more tangible before we go to the meta level. Shlomit, terrorists need finances, and you have been looking deeply into that for years. And you have been recently testifying in front of the US Senate and presented a plan to combat terrorism financing. Could you tell us more about the plan and what it entails? Yes, thank you so much. So uh, after the event of October 7th, I'm uh, currently positioned at Harvard. I was sitting there watching TV. I was terrified with the, um, uh, everything that I saw. And all of a sudden, I remembered that a couple of years ago, I led a task force uh, toward ISIL as part of my role as FATF, the international organization that coordinates terrorism and, and, and money laundering uh, combat. And basically, we managed to do that quite successfully with respect to ISIL. So I took the exact same toolbox and suggested to impose that on Hamas, which basically means that no one country can combat terrorism. You have to create a global coalition. You have to make sure that you have a task force, that there are sharing of intelligence between units, especially financial intelligence unit, and that there are designations coordinated their designation and secondary sanction and so forth. Once this mechanism is being established, you can actually combat it successfully. And indeed, a couple of weeks later, it was established when his FAU's financial intelligence units across the globe initiate that. Many countries started to look for Hamas assets in their jurisdictions. And guess what? When you are coordinated and when you know what to look for, of course, it's not under their names, but um, uh, it's hidden. We've seen so many countries, European countries and others, finding a lot of assets about people that were designated years ago. So that's a very successful struggle, but this is only the beginning in order to kill the activities of terrorism. Thank you very much. You also did some thinking, and you already mentioned Hamas, on how the day after for Gaza could look like. So if the international community wants to chip in for rebuilding Gaza, how, how can we make sure that this money is actually used for rebuilding Gaza and not rebuilding terrorist infrastructure? Exactly. I mean, we're speaking about uh, state sponsorship, and we see that a huge part of Hamas budget comes from states. It's from Iran, $100 million a year, from Qatar, $400 million a year. But in addition to that, we see that the global community is donating funds to the Palestinian Authority and to Gaza in particular for years, billions of dollars. But unfortunately, most of it is being used for terrorism. Uh, the amount of funds that were uh, given by donations uh, to uh, Gaza is four times higher than the Marshall Plan, which was uh, dedicated to the restructuring of Europe after the, the World uh, War II. Uh, instead of building the civil infrastructure, which could have made uh, Gaza look like Dubai or Singapore, they built underground tunnels in which they are actually uh, preparing their activities. And this is another thing about states and non-state actors, how they're 
are actually operating from within the uh, population, the civil population. So in order to look into the future, what could be done differently in terms of fighting terrorism, uh, this very unique model, what I'm now planning and suggesting is a model of the day after, how to ensure that funds will not go to terrorism. And in particular, to avoid cash completely, not to use money exchanger, Hawala style uh, funding and uh, domestic bank, which are controlled by Hamas, instead to use fintech, the fintech industry, which actually allow us to have everything with our cell phone. You could pay anywhere, anywhere to do whatever you want and make sure that everything is traceable and that donors could see, have full transparency on where their funds are going. Some of it will be used by blockchain technology and creating um, a, a local uh, CBDC, Central B Bank uh, Digital uh, Coin internally. But there's a lot of technology, by the way, India, could be a leader on that in the prosperity of the region, bringing over the UPI uh, technology that you have here, a great infrastructure that was already provided to other countries. And with that way, we'll be able to create and perhaps um, uh, turn as, uh, Gaza into a fintech hub in which every donation is fully transparent, traceable, and we know exactly where it goes to buy uh, grocery product services, to reconstruct the area, and ensure that it doesn't go again to terrorism. Technology is very well the solution to do that, and we're now building that in order to provide that for countries and organizations that want to donate for the reconstruction of Gaza and provide humanitarian aid to make sure it goes to the, uh, to the civilians and not terrorism. Thank you very much, Lomet. I uh, could imagine that could also be interesting to tap into during the Q&A, yes. That's, we do Q&A later at the end, the last 15 minutes, okay? Just save your question for then, and then we will bring you in. Um, yeah. You, Shlomit, you already spoke about technology, but that I would like to switch to Aaron. Um, Aaron, the UNCTAD, that's the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, um, their executive director, Natalia German, recently gave a briefing uh, for the UN Security Council and she had two priorities, one of them being new and emerging technologies, especially the terrorists' use of unmanned aircraft system for intelligence gathering, um, strongly underlining that their capabilities to produce small-sized and inexpensive UAEs is increasing. So what is the tech environment's response to that? That's the first part of my question, hold on. The second part, um, Tech Against Terrorism, an organization based in London, uh, reported on over 5,000 pieces of AI-generated content online across ideologies. That's right-wing extremism as well as Islamist ideology content. So how does the tech ecosystem respond to those new threats? Sure, five, five minutes? Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, first, I'm just impressed how many people chose a glass of wine and counterterrorism instead of the topic woke politics. So this is <laughs> this is our crowd. You're my people. Um, but yes, we deal. The Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism is working with tech companies, platforms in particular, that come to the table to want to work on cross-platform and cross-sector solutions for countering terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, raise your hand if you have just one app on your phone. Right, and terrorists are the same, and violent extremists are the same. Nobody has just one app on their phone, maybe under five if you work for the CIA, maybe one if you're in China. It kind of depends a little, but mostly nobody and bad actors are, just like we've always known terrorism is transnational, terrorism is also cross-platform. And what we were realizing back in 2010, 2011, is that you could work for one platform. I used to work for one for four years and we'd track something that maybe looked like signal, maybe recruitment, maybe trying to buy devices. And the second it got a little spicy, the conversation would jump to a smaller, less regulated platform. So a bad actor would pull a user from a bigger open platform into a more end-to-end -end encrypted platform. So it meant that not any one platform can see the full picture, just like how no one government representative can see the full transnational picture without talking to others. So our organization was made to build an infrastructure for tech to be able to work together. Um, that currently looks like needing to develop cross-platform technology. So we run a hash sharing database where the companies and ourselves can identify terrorist and violent extremist content and hash it. If you want technical answers for what hashing is, we can talk about it. So basically, you can share 
a cross-platform signal. So if company A hashes it, then company B, C, D, E, and F can use that like a phishing net and see if that same piece of content was shared on their platforms proactively. That database has something like 2.3 million hashes in it, uh, corresponding to something like 400,000 unique pieces of content. We also need to start breaking our idea of what we mean by content. We keep thinking probably image and video, but a PDF file or a URL link or an audio hash, these are all different types of content and take slightly different algorithms to hash and surface. Clubhouse was hot for a hot minute during the pandemic. They're audio only. Uh, or Giphy, who's a member, is just tiny, small, memefied video clips. All of these take a slightly different form. And we also need to stop just thinking about social media, because when we're talking about platforms, we're also talking about marketplace, where you can go buy some unmanned aerial devices sometimes, or uh, you know some of the places that are just storage files. And it's really hard for an entity like Dropbox, also a member, if you see a massive file of terrorist content, it's really hard to know if you're a terrorist sympathizer or a professor, or probably some of you researchers out here that keep lots of data on terrorist files and keep them logged in different ways online. So this takes a lot of um, sharing, not just across the platforms, but also knowledge sharing across the sectors. So we had to set up an academic wing just to try to get researchers to break their brain a little and write really short, action-oriented insights. I don't think anyone read my 100-page articles back in my academic days. Maybe five people, and I love them forever. But we need kind of like 1,000-word briefs for tech companies. And then we need to share knowledge across sectors. What law enforcement is seeing on the ground is a very different signal to what a moderator sees on a platform is a very different signal to an activist on the ground witnessing what a violent extremist group looks like. And so to kind of end on the new technologies, there are threats and opportunities. Things like unmanned aerial devices have been used for many years by maybe, quote, good guys for different types of surveillance and observation. Now with drones being cheap and easy to buy, we're seeing them reappropriated. Also on generative AI, we already are seeing lots of evidence. We published a paper on it in September just on what that means. Synthetic content isn't new, but we actually need a better policy dialogue on whether or not we consider it the same as we'd consider real content. We run incident response protocols, which track live streams when there's a real world harm event, but there's online assets at play, like live streaming a lone actor attack or the launch of a manifesto online. These things have become a little more popular in recent years. And we realized that what happens if you use generative AI to create what looks like an attack, but maybe is completely fake. But to the audience looking at it, it has the same emotional impact. Should we be considering that different for moderating content or not? We already hash it, but should it have different labels? And then the last I would say is opportunity, not all doom and gloom. Some of this technology is really good for counterterrorism efforts. We've been using ML and AI models and counterterrorism tools for many years. Things like large language models really help better fluency in moderating content in lesser known or lesser popular languages where they're actually getting better than human moderators. It also, if you train them correctly, can remove human bias. If you have a Russian speaker based in Ukraine or Russia that's moderating content, do you have to be aware of those biases? And mm. in theory, the machine can avoid some of those biases. So we'll leave on not a whole doom and gloom note. Thank you. Let me be a bit provocative. Um, I think ever since Christchurch in 2019, um, hashing as well as incident protocols were already the answer from the tech sector to what we have seen them. So what has happened in, let's say, the last two, three years maximum to improve on countering terrorism online from those private companies? What have been the big three gains there? Yeah, well, the first, I mean, Christchurch, there was a white supremacy terrorist attack in New Zealand. And it's important that we know white people can be terrorists too. The designation lists don't always show this. And we could get better uh, when we're kind of guiding tech companies to have a wider view of what terrorism and violent extremism looks like. The first thing that did is because of those types of incident response protocols, we had to move away from just a list designation based approach to how we define what terrorist and violent extremist content is. And we had to move towards behavior based buckets. So in an incident, there is not time when you're looking at a live streamed attack. And just a couple weeks ago, I was following the Mumbai Facebook live stream shooting of a political dialogue. 
And uh, we have not got time in those matters to say, hey, did they, did they brandish a logo? Are they on the UN list? And so actually we have these behavioral protocols now where if the content fits in these behavior buckets, like if it's a manifesto launched by an attacker or like if there's a live stream of murder, attempted mass murder, we don't have to wait for a government designation list. We can move forward. And we've expanded what types of content or signal can be hashed. So again, moving beyond photo and video to move into URLs as a signal or move into audio files and PDFs. And PDFs, by the way, extract both text and image because text classifiers, most content online is not image or video, it's text. And so that allows, and I don't know how many people have read terrorist <laughs> manifestos. On, there we go. Um, they're really long, they plagiarize each other. Definitely some IP concerns and sometimes poor spelling and grammar checks. I, I mean, like you got a joke or else you cry sometimes, but allowing us to extract text, usually people in those subcultures online don't copy and paste the whole 500 page ramble, they'll pick out highlight reels. So text classifiers being layered on top of hashing technology allows us to get at those bits and pieces. So there's more to be done and it's exciting. It, this is where AI gets exciting, um, but always more to be done, but things are still being done. Okay, thank you. We have now looked very much into small, small details of how counterterrorism from the private sector company looks like. Let us now zoom out, and I would like to turn to you, Mr. Harper. It is obvious from what we have heard and what we're reading in the news that the world in 2024 is still busy with fighting terrorism. So is that maybe now the time to pause and reconsider if our multilateral agreements and the instruments that we're having are still fit for the challenge? Or if we have to think afresh, and is that even doable? Um, I, I'm not sure we have to think afresh. I, I think we kind of have to think back a bit and remember how the system is supposed to work or how it does work. Um, you know, obviously, if, if you're dealing with purely non-state actors, violent groups, um, you know, that's, you know, that's a whole separate set of problems that, that states are equipped to handle. I think the bigger problem we're dealing with in the world particularly in the Middle East, I'll focus there, is uh, the so-called quasi-state or even state actors. You take Hamas, it's actually all three. I mean, Hamas is, um, you know, it's a traditional terrorist group in the sense that it uh, targets civilians, uses civilians as shields. It's also a quasi-state group in that it performs a lot of governance functions in Gaza itself and is organized as a conventional military, but it's also a state organization. That is, it is a, is a branch. It is literally a branch plant of the Iranian theocratic empire and acts as its state extension in that part of the world. Um, you know, if you look back, um, what prevented things like this in the past, it was that we had developed both at a macro and a smaller level of a series of rules. And I'm not just talking the rules-based order of the post-World War II era, I'm talking farther back. I'm talking Treaty of Westphalia. Um, you know, the Treaty of Westphalia ended 30 years of war in Europe, uh, accepting that states were sovereign and would respect each other, regardless of whether they were Protestant or Catholic. That would no longer be the basis of, um, of, of um, attacks upon each other. So we established uh, uh, the, the system of sovereign state um, um, community around the world. Um, a smaller example of that was post-World War I, where um, essentially all the countries of the world decided to outlaw uh, warfare by gas, by poisonous gas, partly because we all concluded that no one could win if you actually engaged in that. And so between the knowledge that no one can win and between deterrence around a state system, this is how we kept some degree of world order. I think what's fascinating in the last 20, 30 plus years, particularly when you're talking about the govern uh, government of Iran, is how we have allowed those norms to be eroded by a significant state. I mean, Iran, both claims to be a sovereign state exercising sovereign rights within its territory, but also claims as 
the spiritual leadership of its brand of Islam to have extraterritorial rights uh, around the Middle East. And we have essentially allowed this uh, to continue. We've failed to deter actions when, um, when it has undertaken uh, horrendous acts in, in the name. I mean, the most recent example, this is leave aside Hamas. Let's just talk about the Houthis. Um, here you have uh, an Iranian, you know, once again, a, uh, yes, a terrorist group, yes, a quasi-state actor, but also an extension of the Iranian state, engaged in violent attacks on international shipping. And what does um, the United States, the West, etc., what do we do in response? Yes, we push back on them, but actually uh, explicitly telling the Iranians to get out so they will not be affected by any retaliation. Uh, so we literally tolerate their role as an extra state actor in all of this. Um, and you know, I, I could go on, I could talk about how the situation in Eastern Europe developed because for whatever reason, successive um, Western leaders decided that if countries around Russia's periphery weren't, ne weren't members of NATO, we wouldn't necessarily extend to them the sovereign protections of their territory if they were attacked. And so, you know, we had the incursions in Georgia and Transnistria leading to kind of a partial invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and now a full-fledged invasion. So I just think so much of it is we've, we've, if we're, if we're going to be serious about a world order, um, we actually have to start insisting that those who violate it are engaged appropriately. Um, and particularly, uh, particularly the government of Iran. Um, there, there has to be penalties and there has to be pushback and there has to be deterrence for its uh, fomenting of violent revolution and violent warfare outside its boundaries. And through whom or which entity should that pressure happen? Well, ultimately, uh, you know, the, nobody in the United States wants to hear this, but it'd be principally through the United States and its allies. Um, you know, they are, they are the only ones with both the sufficient power and the, um, and frankly, the su sufficient adherence to, of, to values to enforce that kind of an order. Um, and, you know, I know many in the United States are resistant to this for various reasons, but if they don't do it, the world will continue, the world is unraveling and the world will continue to unravel. But as you say, we've got to be really clear, you know, we, you can't be trying to take on Hamas or letting Israel take on Hamas, trying to take on the Houthis, and at the same time, trying to engage in normalization with the Iranian regime. You can't want Qatar to stop financing terrorism. Well, instead of treating them as a finance of terrorism, you treat them as a valuable interlocutor with Iran and Hamas. I mean, these are just nonsensical paradigms we're dealing with that are leading to an unraveling of global security and a proliferation of non-state and quasi-state violence. Thank you. Um, Marcin, my question plays a little bit into what has been said already about the role of the US. In November 2022, the EU Parliament declared Russia to be a state sponsor of terrorism, but also underlined that there is no legal framework within the EU to designate states as uh, state sponsors. The US, however, can do that. Um, and they currently have four countries um, on their lists, among them Iran. And we also mentioned the Houthis already. If we're looking at them, they're not looking like they're caring about their designation at the moment. So what are like proven instruments that help us to go about state-sponsored and state-nurtured um, entities that the international community can use. Could you also say a little bit more about political leverages that we have here? Thank you very much. Well, look, I think the, the right word you use is political. These are the instruments that we de facto have. If, if we look at a labeling of state sponsorship, right? I mean, it, it, it honestly means whatever any kind of country or a alliance of countries uh, or organization like the EU wants to do, having labeled or used that terminology. It is not a common legal, uh, obviously, setup or understanding. However, I want to go back to what you started the whole conversation about, 
is are, are we really at a sort of shifting moment when we look at uh, the question of terrorism and counterterrorism because of all of those differences, uh, quasi-state actors, state actors, non-state actors, everything that was just said. And, uh, you know, I, the answer is not only yes. The answer is that we actually know where the fundamental problem lies in this new setup. And this is that first time since probably uh, looking before the Second World War, we do have actually one of the key global superpowers that has decided to use terror as part of its policy in relations with uh, other countries. Now that's not something that has happened uh, before and that changes the fundamentals uh, of this dynamic because this is what you have to start to address if you want to look at any further policies to different regions and addressing the true situation of what is happening there. Um, if we look at uh, another region, very important, we talked about the Middle East, but let's look at the Sahel, the biggest increase of terrorist incidents, the biggest increase of radicalization in the last years uh, has been happening there. These are events that are very strongly influenced uh, by Russia uh, as a promoter of state terrorism for their political reasons, right? Uh, it is a country that has decided to destroy a nation completely and destroy its infrastructure, kill uh, hundreds and thousands of people, uh, destroy hospitals, destroy energy infrastructure in order to achieve its political goals, right? This is something that Al-Qaeda would do uh, before. Now we have it operation, operational on a state level, right? Um, and then it is a country that will then use the relations with other organizations to try to back them, such as, you know, not formally, but also Hamas, such as Hezbollah, to pass on messages to keep on the fight because we want instability in order to pursue their political goals. So I would argue that we, we cannot really address those challenges if we don't look at the fundamentals. And these are heavy decisions to be made by alliances. Prime Minister Harper mentioned uh, this. This is, this is something also that refers to, to Iran because we can really count the states that are truly using uh, uh, terror as part of its policy. And I think that's the, that's the angle we should be uh, looking at here. And that's important. I want to add sorry, one more thing uh, before I, I pass on to you. Uh, Shlomo, you, you mentioned you know, the, the, the question of the day after in Gaza. Uh, we can talk a lot about responses, but also the root causes and the fundamentals are known. You have hundreds of millions of people ready to be radicalized, okay? This is a breeding ground. You have in the Sahel, in the Middle East, this is the youngest populations in the world, right? With the highest uh, uh, growth of uh, demographics. Now, if, if we have such an intervention like we do, and I'm not saying Hamas shouldn't be eradicated, have that response, but the way that it's done, you got another generation of terror being grown up. What's the idea here, right? I mean, this goes on for a lot of other responses and engagements in regions. If, if there is no concept, and that's where we go to the more multilateral bigger levels, how to really engage and address on that, we'll be falling into the same trap, just being addressed by different uh, political actors. Let me follow up on that, Marce. Um, you were saying we are in a shifting moment. Uh, could you give us an idea of what that new architecture of counterterrorism could look like, like a couple of pillars that would be vital for it to work again? Well, look, I think we, it should start with having countries which are against this sort of uh, activity fundamentally collaborating closer with each other. It means stronger decisions on the level of uh, alliances like NATO, like EU, uh, like countries in, uh, uh, in the Pacific, uh, in, in South and Eastern Asia. It means stronger collaboration with India. It means stronger collaboration with the West and the Global South, because these are really countries that have so much, uh, first of all, in common in terms of uh, values, second of all, in terms of business interests, that if we see the disruptions uh, and problems that this functioning of state-supported terror and the base uh, in, of the developmental situation uh, that will cost us, and, and it will cost us. And if it's not addressed, uh, it's gonna backfire and backfire strongly. So I think you know these countries coming together is a first step then to take it 
strong, more strongly forward into the common multilateral levels such as the UN. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to ask my last question, but you've got time to think about yours before I hand it over for the Q&A to the audience, but I will ask my question first. Um, James, uh, you said at the beginning already we have to get rid of those concepts. They no longer work. Steve, uh, Stephen and um, also Masse were saying that's a shifting time. So what, what are the, how can we go about those rogue elements in quasi-entities such as Hamas? How can we tackle them as international community? What are the right responses? Yeah, so I think, I'll, I, I think I'll finish where I started because listening to the great panel, I think I'm convinced that, that the right answer is the first thing you have to do is stop thinking that the first step in the problem is deciding what bucket to dump things into. And I think eliminating that construct is actually the key to moving forward. But that doesn't mean we need, that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't have states. I actually think we need stronger states. I think the answer to the question though is defining what do you mean by a stronger state? And I think the number one thing is you have to, you have to shape your instruments so you're equally working to provide security, protect individual liberty, and enhance um, economic freedom. And the challenge in doing that is if you're giving states more power and then you're giving them greater challenges, you're also giving them greater responsibilities. And the challenge is how do you not politicize that? And, 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 I, and I think this is a great example. One of the reasons why we cannot deal with Hamas in the United States is because it's a political problem. We have a, a president whose half his party is strongly in support of Israel, significant part of his policies strongly in support of Hamas, and so his answer is to equivocate between the two. That's letting politics invade, govern your response, and that I think is the prescription for failure and the greatest danger when we structure all the responses that we're talking about. Thank you. With that, I would like to open up. We take three questions at a time. I see one, two, three. Hello. Hi, um, my name is Clara. I work with the International Committee of the Red Cross on protecting civilians in armed conflicts. And uh, my question is for Shlomit mostly, but of course, if anybody else has insights. So I wondered about the FinTech solution that you proposed and um, to what extent you think this is a scalable solution or it is specific to Gaza? Because when you say FinTech is the solution to providing support making sure that the money is not otherwise appropriated. Um, I assume that you would need to account for things like digital divides and making sure that people have equal access. And if we think about places like the Sahel, which is, wasn't much mentioned, but that's actually where a lot of um, activity is at, um, then how would you apply it there? Because Gaza is very small um, and reception might be, might be okay, but I, I see for the Sahel it would be a lot more challenging. So to what extent do you think that this is a solution that can be applied more broadly? Thank you. Thank you, Clara. And there was one more question here. Hi, uh, thanks. My name is Davis McCurry. I'm currently doing peace and conflict research at Uppsala University. And uh, one of the fundamental elements of peace and conflict research is actually defining what it is that we're studying. And maybe I had a question for James and also uh, Prime Minister Harper, if he has time to answer. Uh, are, are we learning any lessons uh, from the experience in Afghanistan? Uh, what are those lessons? Are, are some of the mistakes that were made about 20 years ago being repeated now? And when is it time to cause correct? Thanks. Thank you. I would take on one more question, if there is one. One from the side. Sir, could you pose your question? Could we get a microphone to him? Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Yogesh. I'm a central government employee. Of course, I'm Indian. That's it. I find that uh, uh, in this uh, panel, I've heard few words like state-sponsored terrorism from the moderator herself, nonsensical paradigm from the ex-prime minister of uh, Australia. There are people in this panel from Poland, US, UK, and Israel also. So. Um, nobody has talked about nuclear terrorism. I'm an Indian and I'm pointing towards my Western neighbors. When Hamas has used such primitive means to, to rather show the fragilities of the Israeli 
uh, that fence. And just imagine if uh, uh, those <laughs> nuclear weapons, miniaturized nuclear weapons, get into the hands of the terrorists. Are you worried? Yes or no? Uh, anybody from the panel can answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Dan, Clara, um, Shlomit, would you like to start with Clara's question? Yes, thank you. I think it's a great question. So basic assumption is no terror organization can actually operate without funding. This is their oxygen. Second, they are doing that many times with Hawala, with cash, and with other means. Therefore, uh, it is a challenge to go on technological solutions. However, this is an opportunity. We already see, and Gaza could be a great experiment because it's a relatively short, uh, um, uh, small area. Everyone has cell phone uh, and Wi-Fi and there is electricity. That, that's not a problem in Gaza. So that's a great place perhaps to do a pilot. I'm already involved in a couple of projects of uh, international organizations that are providing aid to refugees around the globe with um, all the uh, um, traditional cell phones, just with SIM, no Wi-Fi, nothing more than that. It works. But the challenges there are not terrorism financing. Here we have a different challenge. Indeed, I do think that this is completely scalable because you could uh, duplicate the same technology and use that uh, with just very simple and basic uh, communication. It's also a very uh, well uh, method to create financial inclusion. And also with some biometric um, identification mechanism, you can actually also bring into the radar people who are not have identification in certain areas. Um, with solar energy and so forth. I mean, this, the private sector has solutions for all of it. We just need to make sure that international organizations that want to distribute funds are adopting that and are creating a very firm um, a coalition, making sure that everyone transfer funds only through those channels. And that way, yes, I, did, I think this is, can make a change and a difference across the globe. Thank you. Mr. Harper, could you say something on the question on the Afghanistan lessons? Sure. Uh, first of all, let me just maybe add to, uh, to that answer on the terrorist financing. I'll go, go back to what I said. I think it's, it's absolutely true. We have the means, in most cases, to determine where terrorist finances is, are coming from. But the real question then is whether we have the will to actually do anything about it. Um, we know that a lot of terrorist financing flows through Qatar. And yet, there is absolutely no sanction on Qatar for allowing that to happen. On the contrary, as I said, they are treated as a valuable interlocutor. In the case of the, uh, of the Saudis, who the West has been very hard on, uh, they in fact have cracked down on terrorist financing. And we give them no credit, and the Qataris do it, and we treat them as a valuable interlocutor. So. We've got to get our, our, as I say, our kind of paradigm aligned here. On um, Afghanistan, um, look, I think it's a great question um, because the short answer is, as near as I can tell, um, you know, after we in the West and others spent some, how long was it, 20 years plus in Afghanistan and, and ultimately failed, there has been actually, as near as I can tell, no assessment of why that failed. Um, no assessment whatsoever. And I, you know, I, I personally, I think if you look at it, there are some things you can discern. Uh, once again, the paradigm didn't match the actions. We said we were going to eradicate terrorism in Afghanistan and rebuild the country, um, a kind of a nation building exercise. Well, in fact, other than forcing the Taliban out of the major cities, they weren't actually defeated militarily. They were allowed to continue. And then, you know, from then on, um, the attempt to create an alter alternative government structures were just flawed and unsuccessful because of that from day one. So, um, you know, as I say, I think, I, I just think um, in so many of these things, we in the West have to be really clear on what our thinking is when we get into these conflicts or these situations, what are our objectives? And what are the means we're prepared to use to make sure those objectives are fulfilled? And there just isn't the hard thinking around any of these questions. Thank you. Speaking about means, James, are you worried um, that nuclear weapons could get into the wrong hands by malicious actors? I mean, I still think, you know, after 
20 plus years of, of this issue that we've got a lot of evidence that that's not the most practical solution for a non-state actor. Right? First of all, it's incredibly difficult to get that. Even the most reckless states in the world really aren't willing to give it away. And if you've learned anything as a non-state actor, it's look at the amazing amount of destruction and damage you can do um, not having a nuclear weapon. And not only on October 7th, it's a great example. Look at the, the, the violence that was done, not only without a nuclear weapon, but actually where you have a, a significant portion of the world actually rooting for you after October 7th. So I just don't think that's incredibly practical. You know, the, the one thing that we've learned from nuclear weapons, and if Iran becomes a declared nuclear state, we'll learn this again, is nuclear weapons are really only good for one thing, and that's deterring nuclear war with another state that has nuclear weapons. And I, I actually don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. This time I'm turning towards here because you were in my back previously. If you could go first, the lady over there, and then we take the young man over here. Uh, my question is to Mr. Harper. Sir, you were uh, alluding to Iran, uh, how Iran has been accommodated uh, in the case of uh, fighting the Houthis. So what would you say about NATO uh, NATO's fight in uh, Taliban when you accommodated Pakistan, despite India's concern about how the funds that you were giving to Pakistan were being pumped into India for terrorist activities. Thank you. No, it's uh, look, it's it, it's an excellent question. I appreciate the linkage. This, I say, was just one example of the um, the inconsistencies and the flaws that were inherent in the Afghan mission. Um, we said we were you know, going to eliminate terrorism in that part of the world, and yet a policy was developed to turn a deliberate blind eye to um, the neighboring country, which, which was actually sponsoring some of this activity. Um, you know, I'll give you another example of the contradictions in the mission. It said we, we said we wanted to rebuild a Jeffersonian democracy in, in Afghanistan. I think it was probably unrealistic to begin with. But then one of the first things we did was allow a constitution which declared it an Islamic Republic, um, essentially a, um, a, uh, a non-secular state. So um, I, I, these are just examples of the deep flaws that, that, ultimately, um, that ultimately undermined the mission. Uh, and as I said to our earlier questioner, I think the real uh, challenge has been that, that we haven't sat down and analyzed these things. And as a consequence, we see some of the same mistakes repeating themselves as we deal with Iran and the current problems uh, in the uh, Middle East. Thank you. And we have one more question here. Hi, my name is uh, Purujit. My question is for James. Uh, it's related to the response to attacks. Uh, what we saw on October 7th, while people call it primitive, which it was, it seemed to be more of a non-state actor special operation of sorts, like a multi-domain military operation that would have conventionally been in the domain of the state. So how do modern states today and their militaries respond to something like this within the rules-based order and that framework that we operate in? How can you even respond when there's you know, a social media angle, there's coordinated, planned attacks? Uh, how do you respond in, in today's day? That is a really great question. Um, and, and I think it gets exactly to the paradigm that I'm describing, which is d dividing different paradigms isn't, a, it isn't really helpful. And the answer is, is you need a military response because it's a physical security threat. And, and the question is, how do you employ that military? And the answer is, you would employ it in the same way, whether it was a state actor or a non-state actor. And I, th I think the Israelis have tried to do this. They have tried to ad adhere to obligations under the Geneva Convention to follow the, uh, the just war approach to this um, and, and a safeguard, in a sense, in an appropriate way. And, and that's the right thing. To do. I'll give you a contrasting example, which is a huge mistake. So one, one of the things we did after 9-11, when we started getting detainees, we said, well, they're not, they're not state actors under the Geneva Convention. Therefore, we do not have a requirement to provide them the same kind of response that we do if they were a prisoner of war. And we're actually strengthening the concept of prisoner of war because we're not treating them the same. But the reality is, is it doesn't matter. We should have treated them the same. 
And it would have actually, I think, strengthened the American, not only our moral and ethical response, but actually the nature of our military response and not complicate things. Because when you send a military to combat and you say, well, if, if you're fighting this terror, not that you're a terrorist, no, no, but you, you, you do whatever you want, right? But if you're fighting this guy in a uniform, you have to follow one way thing. We should have one set of rules, right? Uh, I, I don't think we'll ever have a rules-based order. I think it's fairy dust. But I do think when you set rules and follow them, the first thing you have done is provided stability to what you bring to the table as an actor. And I do think that's really important no matter who you're facing as an opponent. Um, just perhaps one sentence on that. I think of speaking about state and non-state actors, the situation between Israel and Gaza is impossible because uh, Hamas is actually operating within the civilians. They are, took the hostages into private homes. Tom, some of them are staying with families, people that were really saying that they were living with a family. So the situation, the equation here is almost impossible because on one hand, you do not want to uh, impact severely the citizen, uh, the Palestinian citizen, the innocent one. But at the same time, because there is no military on the other side, you have to do actions uh, that are very complex. And I don't think that any army in the world has ever uh, needed to confront such a situation. And I know that outside it looks pretty, um, uh, it not look very well. However, the dilemmas are really severe. Just imagine that someone is kidnapping you from your home um, in your pajama with your children, with your babies, taking you to a tunnel or a house. The, the state actor has to do something to protect its citizen, and that's an impossible situation. And um, um, a Hamas is enjoying by having by being a non-state actor um, and making that complex. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.